In this episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast, we sit down and talk with Tim Gabbett, who has not one, but two PhDs, and is one of the world's leading sports scientists. He is the pioneer of the acute to chronic workload ratio. And in short, this is the ratio that helps optimize athletes and helps reduce their injury risk. We talk about that and so much more. I hope you enjoy the episode. What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast with me, the human performance mechanic. And today I am here with Dr. Tim Gabbett or Dr. Dr. Tim Gabbett, two, two times uh, PhD. Uh, <laughs> again, I always, uh, <laughs> it's always mesmerizing to me that he decided to go through that process, not once, but double dip and, and go back again. But um, I love... You know, I love talking with Tim. Uh, I've known Tim for years now. Um, I've had him come to New York to help uh, teach his own courses, which we'll get into a little bit. But Tim is a world-renowned sports scientist, consults with the top teams. I mean, I'd be more interested, Tim, at this point in knowing what sports you haven't worked with in some capacity. But... um, but Tim is an extremely well-published uh, author. I would say, you know, at least over 300 publications the last time I, I looked. Um, Tim is somebody who I've looked up to for his work ethic and his, um, the, just the consistency of, of what he's doing and the passion uh, for, for what he's doing, just being a student in um, either of his two courses, um, training smarter and harder or harder and smarter again, whatever. And then the training performance puzzle, but I'm um, really excited to dig in for the next hour and change. Talk with uh, Dr. Gabbett about all things sports science and helping us as clinicians and sports scientists be better at, at what we're doing. And we'll delve into his body of work and his thoughts on that process. Um, so welcome, Dr. Gabbett. How's it going? It's, uh, I guess we, we, we calculated it's 15 hours ahead. So it's a evening for me, but it's beautiful, bright midday for you. So welcome to the it is, it's, Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah. Great, great to come on. And so glad that you, you've put this podcast together. It doesn't surprise me that you, you put it together. Um, you know, the first time, actually the first, the first meal I had in New York was with you and Karen Litzy. Um, and you know, your passion for the, for the area, passion for the field came through <laughs> really hard, really strong. Um, so, uh, it doesn't surprise me that you've gone ahead and done a podcast as well. So well done on putting it together. It, this was, remember, when was the first time that we, we we had dinner. This is probably 2017, 18, 2018. Yeah, it was um, around, it or maybe was early 2019. Um, but so it's been it's been a while. So uh, it getting overwhelmed with the the whole process. I'm, I'm finally kind of just said enough. And I've had all these conversations in general with other practitioners practitioners researchers offline and i was like why not just like record it hit play let's just go and let's just get nerdy and talk about um how we can be better at our jobs basically um so so yeah i mean for for those that aren't aware of your body of work you know a three to four minute intro who you are why you decided to go back for a second PhD and what that what that kind of did to your understanding of sports science and for your expertise how you got into I always associate with you with acute to chronic workload and monitoring athlete training load so how did you get into that hmm. okay well we may as well start at the beginning not not too far back but um my I used to follow my father around everywhere. 
right? And they used to call me his shadow because everywhere he went, I'd go with him. And he he um, used to train athletes, runners, football players, soccer players, rugby players. Um, he, and he was very good at a time when people were not very good. Um, and the, the things I learned from observing the way he worked, from actually training with him, I learned more about training from him than I ever did from any textbook. Uh, it, those experiences... I wouldn't swap them for anything in the world. Um, now that was a time before before qualifications. Um, you know, he he had a he had a career and a, a professional career in a completely different area of life. But I that's how I I got exposed to training from a really early age. Um, and I've been I've been kind of learning about it ever since and doing it ever since. And th- and that that started you know, following him around at, at football sessions or or gym sessions, weight weight room sessions was pre teens, you know, I think it was probably ten or eleven when I first started doing some training with him. Um now as as time went on I um did did my degrees like most people do. I, I did a PhD in an area that was available to me to do so it was a funded project it was a large nhmrc funded project um but it was in an area that i wasn't i didn't think i'd be going into so i ended up doing a phd in a field that i that i wasn't really passionate about i learned a lot about the research process and and good research and good design um how to present data well, how to interpret data, how to interpret findings and the practical applications of it. I learned a lot about writing. Um, but when I when I finished that that study, I I'd I'd always been working in sport, even while I was doing the degree, I was working in sport. So I just went straight back into sport as soon as I finished that. Um, what was your PhD it, in for those that uh yeah, well, it was in um, blood pressure control in um, older individuals, like 65 to 75 year olds, um, and it was the effect of training on blood pressure control. Now, at the time, there was a, a school of thought that as you got fitter, your blood pressure control got worse. All right, so so there's this there's this trade off. We could be giving older individuals a training program strength or a conditioning strength or an aerobic training program that in theory improves their functional capacity but then when they stand up to get out of bed in the morning they fall over because they've got no blood pressure control their blood pressure control system stops working as well so that was the that was the theory at the time and but you know i i did a whole heap of training studies um got them fitter got them stronger and nothing changed on their blood pressure control. They were they were just they're just as good before. And I, st- after. I still don't get why that whole like I'm I'm trying to wrap my head around why would and again I think this is might be just because what we know about exercise now and versus when you got your PhD. But uh. I mean, to my understanding, we get we get stronger which, you know, I'm assuming muscle mass, right? But that's not always the case. You could get stronger without putting on muscle mass or you get fitter. So your cardiovascular capacity improves. That to me all screams better ability to manage stress. So I guess it's it, it's interesting that that idea even got traction. Well, I mean, it, it started way back in the 70s when um, so when astronauts come back from space um, there's there's such huge g forces and um, there's what what they found was that the athletes who were most likely to pass out on re-entry were the ones who were the fittest Right, so it was it was just a, an association there. They found that these athletes or these these astronauts were more likely to pass out when they were exposed to these high high levels of stress, where where the central blood volume is is dumped into the periphery, 
and that's that's typically what happens when we stand up. We lose ten percent of our circulating blood volume, so so it it gets dumped into the periphery, it pools in the periphery, and and then you get that lightheaded. So you see soldiers fainting on parade, you see older people part, falling over because their blood pressure control just can't kick in quick enough. And they were they found or well, they saw that the fitter astronauts were the more most likely to pass out, right? So that then they there were even some studies way back then that said um, trained trained men can run, but they can't stand. And the big one was if you have an, an astronaut that has a, a fitness level that's above a certain standard, a controlled deconditioning program should be put in place to prevent uh, to prevent them passing out on re-entry, right? So there was this real um, – there, there was this view that you could almost be too fit. Um, now wow. That, when you, that is when you think about, fascinating. When you think about – the changes that occur that typically what you get is a there's a few rationales for it one is one is that you you get blood volume changes and the second is that you get and typically it's blood volume expansion with endurance training the second is that you get a shift in order autonomic balance so you get a, a heavier parasympathetic tone and you get a reduction in sympathetic tone now what you need when you stand up quickly is is mm-hmm. sympathetic tone. You need the sympathetic, you need parasympathetic to pull back and you need sympathetic to switch on so that your heart rate goes up and your blood pressure and your, your blood vessels contract. Um, but it, when you have high parasympathetic tone, there was a view, there was a school of thought that that, that dampened the response, that you had a, a smaller response to that orthostatic challenge. And that's why why people were more likely to pass out when they stood up. But, you know, we, we measured a whole heap of stuff and said, you know, they all got fitter. They all got, you know, in terms of functional capacity, they all got better through training. Control group didn't change. They did exactly what we wanted them to do. But nothing changed in terms of blood pressure control. You could superimpose one test on top of the other and they were almost identical. Yeah, not to get on a tangent here, because I, I do find that so interesting. Did they ever, like, has there been any additional work into that area? Because I I understand that idea of of the the imbalance. So, like, then you take the converse, where if you're heavily resistance exercise trained, then you tend to experience more sympathetic resting activation so i guess i'm trying to wrap my head around the what could be the reason because clearly it's only happening if if the if the derivative of this observation was because they're enter they're more fit and entering from space to the you know in orbit and the, the people that are fitter what do you think or have they looked at any sort of follow-up as to why being fitter is actually associated with that imbalance in autonomic nervous system function? It's yeah, it's not necessarily the, the fitness per se. It, it's the, the potentially the, um, the the physiological changes that are that occur with with training. So so what one is that. Um, because you have a lower resting heart rate, you've got a higher parasympathetic tone, so a lower resting heart rate. You've got a higher blood volume, so therefore a higher stroke volume. Your cardiac output um, is the same at rest. It's there's this slower pulsatile pressure over the baroreceptors, um, and potentially that is what changes is the difference between an untrained and a trained individual. The reality is. There's a whole heap of hypotheses for it. There's a whole heap of, um, you know, speculation of what could be happening. Um, I I think in time, you know, now that we're and we're close to thirty years on since I did those initial studies, thirty years on, I think the school, I think thinking has probably changed a whole lot now, and and people are going, you know, train <laughs> training is not as bad as what we thought it was. Maybe there's a whole heap of other reasons for this this let's call it a faulty blood pressure control system 
that has nothing to do, that has less to do with, you know, aerobic training or strength training. And it's, it's just more to do with there's, there's other factors involved in blood pressure control. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, in terms of the take home point, point for me would be if you're a 65 to 75 year old and you, or if you're training clients that are 65 to 75 year old, um, encourage them to do aerobic work, encourage them to do strength work. Um, it's, and if they do get lightheaded when they stand up quickly, just don't stand up as quickly. Just take your time getting up and um, give yourself a little bit of time for the blood pressure to normalise. Uh, but in terms of changing your blood pressure control system, I don't think training does. It doesn't change it in a negative way. So then, so that that was your first PhD. So you mm. went in, so to summarise, that wasn't really an area that you were fully, like truly passionate about, um, which again, I guess the next question goes, if you weren't truly passionate about it, but you decided to do it anyways, what kind of maniac does that? <laughs> um, only because I, listen, I don't have a PhD um, yet, but from from those that I've, I've talked with, um, it's a rigorous process. So I can only imagine not being super passionate about it. Like what made you decide, hey, I'm going to go get this PhD in a field that I'm kind of like interested in maybe, but like not really. Um, what, what pulled the, what, what pulled the, the trigger for you? Yeah, well, look, I think that the seeds for that, the seed for that was probably planted years and years earlier, probably when I was following my dad around and, and, you know, I, I think probably what I, the things that have driven me in my life, uh, I don't, I don't need to be the best at something, but I need to, to be my best, right? I need to, I need to give my best. Um, and, and you, you'll know it with, with your interactions through me and when, when you've met in courses, there's a and and you know what it's like when you're delivering a course you, you know when someone is going through the motions and you know when someone is given everything they've got and and that's that's typically when, when if you if you're going to have an interaction with me if you're going to train with me if you're going to do a course with me if you're going to do some research with me you know that you're going to get effort you you're going to get um you're not going to get half half of what I can give. I'm going to give you everything I've got, um, and and that was probably my approach when it came to the PhD. Now the the reality was there wasn't a lot of options back then. Not like they there are now. Like you can you can do uh, PhDs embedded in sport. You can do PhDs embedded in a in a research program that's you know right in in your area of interest. Back then it, it wasn't so much the case. Mm. Um, and and that was that was the one that was offered to me, and um, you know I, I don't regret I don't regret doing it, um, it, but it helps if you're going into a process that's three to four years long. That it helps if you've got the fire in the belly to start with, because when you get to the the middle of it, you it's and you and you're getting knockbacks along the way through through publications getting knocked back or rejected and. Um, there's all these hoops you've got to jump through and, and you might get rid of knockbacks there. Then you, you know, if you, it takes a, takes a, a lot of, a lot of effort to, to get yourself out of bed and keep going and keep moving forward with it. Um, so, th- you know, when you say what kind of maniac does that? Well, you know, if, if you're not a little bit mad to start with, you, you're probably, you're probably well on the way by the end of it. Well, that's too, it just, it goes back to, and this is a little off topic again, continuing on your, your journey, but it, in order to, to make a dent in any sort of field that you're in, there has to be a consistent effort. And it's very difficult to give a consistent effort over days, weeks, months, and years if you don't have some sort of fire in your belly that drives you because 
it's and I can only speak about the BFR. Um, and I'm sure you can speak about some of the recourse that has been going on with um, acu acute to chronic workload in the literature. But, you know, you get people that are coming at you and and they're cynical and they're calling out, you know, your thoughts and beliefs. And you really just have to soldier on and understand that, like, you're doing this for for science and you're doing this to help people and kind of push away, you know, the haters, um, and, and really just keep, keep moving. Um, and that's really what, um, your, your body of work to me has shown. It's just, it's just consistency and, and just for lack of better term, like grinding. Like I see you, obviously we've known each other for years, seeing you travel all over the world. You're still getting publications in, you're still practicing what you preach on your Instagram. Now you're being even more on your social media track. So now you're, you're posting about your own training. You recently posted about the differences in accumulated volume over year over year about your running, which I thought was really cool because that is objective data that shows that you've built a chronic workload capacity uh, in your system. So you're practicing what you preach, um, which is, is always very, very admirable, especially in these days of social media where you have to do like, you have to grab headlines in, in some way, shape or form to, to get attention. And I think that that is a good segue to kind of trans transition into how did you get into monitoring athletes training loads? So after your PhD, you, you're like, all right, I'm going to work with athletes. Take us from there. Yeah. Well, I mean, even during the PhD, I was working, working with athletes. So it, it dates, it dates back kind of pre PhD. So from, from the early nineties, right, right through that's, that's been the, the constant. There's always been athletes in my life. You know, there's always been doing something with athletes. Um, so I, at the time of my PhD, I was I was working with a, a rugby team, and one of the th one of the things that we talk about with training is periodization. We talk about progressive overload, and essentially, what I wanted to know with this team was, well, you know, I've I've, I've read the texts. How do I how do I make sure that when I say I'm overloading, that that I am progressively loading, and when I'm unloading, how do I know that I'm unloading? Um, we didn't have GPS. There was no, there was no wearables. Um, so what we, what I did was just use session RPE, uh, where you you take an RPE at the end of every session, you multiply it by the duration. That gives you an internal training load for that session, and then you can look at it um, session by session, day by day, week by week. Um, and and you know that was kind of my first attempt to quantify training load, and and look at a response variable. The, the response variables um, they ranged from you know, when I when I give a certain training stimulus, what's the performance result? So what does what happens to physical qualities if I train a certain way? Um, but I was I also did a lot of work looking at the relationship between training load and injury then, and and that was that formed the basis of you know the my some of my first ever studies looking at training load and injury. And that was the late nineties that, that those studies were done. Um, so, so there, the, the training load, I was always obviously interested in training load just through, through being around it my whole life. But now I was taking it from a situation of um, I've done it for a long period of time. Now I'm doing it and, and monitoring it and trying to capture what my athletes are doing. Um, so getting a better understanding of the dose response relationship. So, so take us, take us through that, that evolution. So you, you're, you're attempting to, <clears throat> to quantify internal training load. And now we need to relate that to, to their performance in some capacity, where kind of did the, the golden, you know, the, the, the golden acute to chronic workload, how did that evolve? Um, because then it got taken as, um, and I'll, and I'll just front load this for, 
for any listeners or viewers is that the last time I, I took a course with you, you were aware of some of the the criticisms, but you were saying how this never should be ta- should have been taken as gospel anyways, but a guide into making training related decisions and how we can optimize our programming. Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's um, work our way backwards from this. We know that um, when we load relative to capacity, if we load a little bit more than our current capacity, then we get better. We get we improvements in capacity, and and that's just progressive overload. But we also know that if we throw excessive load at our capacity, that increases the risk of a whole heap of negative outcomes: poor performance, poor well-being, and injury. So, so the, the trick here is we want to load just enough to get better, but not so much that we break our athletes. Now, this is, this is what physical therapists deal with day in, day out with, with the athletes, the clients that you work with. Um, so so this, is, this is what we're really talking about is loading relative to capacity. And that's what the acute to chronic workload ratio is all about, is loading relative to capacity. Essentially, what you're asking is, is the load that we're about to give our athlete, are they prepared for it? Are they prepared for the load that we're about to give them? And, and the way that we, we assess preparedness, capacity, is through chronic load. What have they been able to do over a long period of time? And and then we just we look at the say the current load that we're about to give them or the current week that we're about to give them, that acute stimulus, and we say, well, we make a judgment call. Is this is this a small amount relative to their capacity, or is this an excessive amount relative to their capacity? The acute chronic ratio puts a number to that. It it allows you to to say, well, look, we're about to give this athlete um, 10% more than what they're, they're currently used to, than what they're prepared for. So the acute chronic ratio is 1.1. But if it's if you're about to do uh, 100% more or double what, what, it, what they've been used to, then the acute chronic ratio is going to be 2.0. Now, it could be 3.0 or 4.0. Now you're starting to really ramp that athlete up really quickly relative to their capacity. Now, it's it's not... It's not meant to be anything other than a way to sensibly progress load, to to start a conversation and say, well, if we want to progress load, this is one way that we can do it. Um, Now, how I got to that point, at at the time, um, as I was going through different research projects, um, we would see the textbooks would say that overuse injuries occur due to overtraining. So overtraining, okay, must be excessive loads. What I was finding was that our athletes with the highest training loads had the lowest injury risk. They had the lowest, they were always available. Players with the highest loads had the the lowest injury risk, whereas the the players who were injured all the time were always getting injured at low loads. And, And that was, it wasn't making any sense to me. That Like, how is it that this is going against what the textbook is telling us doesn't high loads cause overuse injuries. And then it, it dawned on me, actually, if you look at what we've done with those athletes with low loads, when we're bringing them out of rehab, we've doubled what they've done in the last few weeks. We've, we've asked them to do twice as much as what they've been prepared for. And or one and a half times or three, it was generally a large number. And when we trained like that, what happened was those players who were already at low loads got injured again, and then they had to go circle back and start again at low loads. They were in that chronic rehab cycle. Um, now, I can't tell you whether the, the players or the athletes with the higher loads, whether it's just a survivor bias, mm-hmm. that if, if, you're, if you're strong enough to handle whatever training throws at you, you're obviously going to accrue high training loads, and you're not going to get injured, so you're just going to keep accruing high training loads. So it's, a, it's hard to know whether it's, it's chicken or egg there. But is, it, is it high training load that protects you against injury, or is it the fact that you haven't been injured that allows you to accrue high training loads? But what's, 
what's indisputable with that, the, the previous start was that low loads, our athletes were breaking down at low loads, but they were high loads relative to where they'd come from. Right, so it was double or triple what they'd been prepared for, and that's that was the genesis of of the acute chronic ratio. It's okay now. Now we've got um, a, a rationale here of we can we can load relative to what our athletes were prepared for. Can we can we do some more studies on this? And there's been a lot of studies to validate the acute chronic workload ratio, looking at the acute chronic workload ratio and the risk of injury, the acute chronic ratio and well-being, and the acute chronic ratio and performance. Pretty much th there's a consistent theme there that when you ramp up loads really quickly or when you come from a really low base and don't have high chronic loads, that you have greater risk of poor performance, you have greater risk of poor well-being, and you have a greater risk of injury. And it's there's a, a whole heap of studies that have shown that. What are you know you you mentioned uh, internal training loads, external in terms of loading or or activities. What are commonly um, measured in terms of so for example, um, if you have an athlete that um, are you monitoring the acute to chronic workload? for sports specific activities, or is this like the gym? Because all of these are gonna increase internal load in a training cycle. So how are you quantifying the, 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 the relative demand of a weightlifting session, which all these athletes are, are, are partaking in, to a sprint session, to a sports specific, like three on three drill or something like that? Yeah, well, look at um, if we if we look at different sports, um, they, they've all quantified load in slightly different ways, and and I assume it's in part due to how easy it is to get the load information. So if we look at um, college baseball players, that they, they've done it with pitch counts, um, and you can you know there's wearables now that can can basically catch uh, capture every every pitch that's been thrown. Um, if we look at um, NFL, American football, they will look at something like um, GPS statistics, uh, movement statistics, where they're looking at high speed and sprinting yards and looking at the external load done there and the risk of injury. Uh, there are studies that have, that have tried to capture all training load. Now, the problem with capturing all training load or the challenge of capturing all training load is it is what you can capture via GPS in the field is not, not that useful for what you can capture in the, in the weight room. And equally what you can capture in the weight room doesn't necessarily, um, they don't marry up. It does inform what you do, but it doesn't marry up. So this is where the session RPE comes in handy. It's a, uh, it's uh, so, you know, it's not foolproof, and and people either love it or they hate it, um, or you know, but as long as you know the limitations of it, what you can do is you can capture any training load that you're performing, from from rehab, right through to the weight room, right through to to the coach's on field practice, or on court practice, and you've got a, a standardized unit of measurement, so then you can. You can sum the different training sessions across the day. You could have three different modalities. You can sum them and you can see where that training load is coming from. If you've got 1,000 units of training load for the day, you might have 600 units on the field. You might have 300 units in the weight room and you might have 100 units with the physical therapist doing local tissue loading. Um, so you can see where that load is coming from. So you mentioned physical therapists. How how have, in your experience working in elite sport, how has the physical therapist been in terms of their role in getting an athlete back to performance, like the, the cooperation with the strength coaches? And how are they, if any, are, are creating a tandem you know, relationship with each other so 
that when they're injured, we they are produ- they are uh, creating the foundations for establishing a chronic workload. Well, I mean, obviously not all not all environments are as effective as you'd like, and and typically, I mean, you can spot them um, as soon as you walk into the to the facility. You know the ones that are working well and the ones that aren't, and and you know the reality is. Not all environments work well, and and maybe, maybe that explains some of the reasons why some teams are always bad. Um, you know, like it, it, it's not it's not the only reason, but it mm. might it might go some way to explain it. Um, but then there's you know there's a whole heap of other environments, and I've had far more positive experiences than negative, where you've got a really joined up integrated approach where the physical therapy team and the strength staff are working together. Um, they, they know that there needs to be a balance of local tissue and sports specific loading when there's, when there's injury that's, that's occurred. The emphasis is going to be on local tissue loading, but they're doing everything they can to, to maintain some sort of global loading so that, that, when they have to bridge the gap between rehab and performance or returning to performance or reconditioning, that it's not a massive jump. And equally, um, the good strength coaches know that when you have a healthy athlete, yes, the, the vast majority of loading is going to be on, on sport-specific capacity, but the good programs are doing regular reminders of local tissue loading. And, and you could see that in any number of ways um, it, it could be for a runner who's who's an endurance runner. They're they're doing their, their calf work, right? They're they're doing their soleus work. They're doing their gastro work. They're um, they they a sprinters doing their um, their eccentric hamstring strength, right? So they're 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 not only doing their sport specific work of of running, or sprinting, or in baseball throwing a ball. They're actually doing regular touches of local tissue health, local tissue capacity, and that's that's the best programs when it's joined up. And there's they've got one the one the one vision. The one vision is we want to win. It's a performance vision, and then when you have a performance vision, when you have a performance mindset, and and that that is your focus, then it takes. A lot of the egos out of it. Um, it it makes the training process really easy because you say, well, what is what? How would we train if we just wanted to get to the best performance as possible? What would the training program look like? Right, and it just so happens that the way you train for the for good performance is the way that you train for injury prevention as well. Right, so you kill two birds with one stone. You don't you stop worrying about the injury problem. And you just focus on performance. Everyone's focused on that goal. Um, there's no better place to be than when you've got a joined up um, group of staff, sports medicine and performance staff joined up working towards that goal. Yeah, like the it's interesting you're talking about local tissue capacity and, and performance because I think um, sometimes people get bogged down in the sense that, oh, well, they're practicing for their sport or they're doing sport specific movements that should be enough to help keep the athlete conditioned and ready to go. What is the importance of local tissue capacity in your opinion, Um, not being a physical therapist, but a sports scientist. And why is that so instrumental in being a supplement, not a replacement, but a supplement to performance training and sports specific work. Yeah, but look, I think there's there there is people who would argue that um, your sports specific work is enough. Um, but let's let's take the the example of a baseball pitcher. Um, and and I know Tommy John um, injuries and surgeries are the you know the the big the big uh, issue in in baseball pitching. Now, part of the issue there is they're throwing it at such high speeds that it's very hard to decelerate the arm 
after the ball's been thrown. So, so the elbow is doing all the work. That ligament is doing all of the work. So, so an example of local tissue loading is uh, what we do know is if you can have stronger ex shoulder external rotators, then then that actually reduces your risk of elbow injuries for the baseball baseball pitcher. Now, the, the rationale there is, is that perhaps the external rotators are acting to slow the – they can slow the, the arm down after the ball's been thrown so that less of the work's been done by the elbow. So if you go into good athletic training rooms and, and physical therapy rooms in any baseball facility, you will see players working on um, low-level external rotator strength. So they're just – they're putting the arm in, in a lot of different scenarios, a lot of different um, – angles and, and with different levers working on the external rotators. So they might have a, a heavy ball where where the trainer is throwing it to them. They're tracking the ball. They're catching the ball. They're throwing it back using their external rotators. They're slowing the ball with the external rotators and they're contracting it to, to throw the ball back to the trainer. They, they're doing stuff like that. They're doing any number of external rotation exercises as well. Now, if you, if you look at that exercise on its own, you're going, there's no way – that exercise is going to prepare a pitcher to throw the ball at 100 miles per hour, right? There's, there's no way. Um, so, but what it does is it's a, it's a, a way to, to enhance your local tissue capacity. It, it, it strengthens those, those weak links, those potential weakest links. If you can make them as strong as possible, then what that allows you to do, if you can handle that that lower level loads, then it puts you in a better position to handle higher level loads. If you can handle higher level loads, then it then it puts you in the position to handle the demands of competition. Now you can use that that type of um, example, and you can apply it to to any sort of sport, right? So you can you can look at marathon running. Just because you can do 25 single leg heel, leg, heel leg heel raises, does that mean that you're ready to run 26 miles, right? And you look at it and you go, well, geez, there's a big gap there. Um, but the idea is those calves and, and the supporting structures, they're going to have to be dealing with a, a whole heap of steps across that 26 miles. You want to put your, your body in the strongest position to handle those forces and and running alone is is not a an effective um, strength stimulus. It's certainly not a, a, a stimulus that's bone centric. So it's not something that's going to build bone. If you want to build bone and you want to put yourself at lower risk of bone stress injuries, for example, for a marathon runner, then you're going to have to do strength training and you're going to have to do plyos and and the benefit, if you don't believe in the injury prevention benefits of it, then just focus on the performance enhancing benefits of it. If you do plyos, you're going to get more efficient. So that, that 26 miles is going to come at less cost. You're going to do it a lot easier than if you don't do it at all. Then you're going to be working so much easier just by doing plyos, by doing strength work. Um, so there's, there's a whole heap of examples that you can use there where local tissue loading Improves your ability to handle sport-specific load, which then improves your ability to handle the demands of of your sport. Yeah, I think that is so important to understand because a lot of times people look at the um, the effects of strength training on a single joint, and they're like, "Well, wait a second, like this is not really integrated." And what what is the difference? But I think you hit on it, and I totally agree that you can improve efficiencies. And I think you said this, um, which I really actually love, which is if you train for performance, you're training for injury prevention or reduction, whatever you want to call it. And I think I actually hadn't hadn't actually put that together in my my head. Um, because it really is true because if you're training for performance, what are you doing? You're optimizing tissue qualities that are going to help you in theory, reduce your risk of injury. Um, and then the, the tissue specific work would be optimizing those parts that are within that chain that will be 
experiencing or could be experiencing heightened stress or be the weak link in that. So ultimately then you're, you're, you're basically feeding one into the other. Um, and that's where you mentioned about the Nordic hamstrings for redu reduction in, in sprinting injuries um, and the external rotator work for, for, the, for the pitcher. So I think that that's something that um, we all need to just keep in mind when we're working with patients or clients is, is that sometimes the hypertrophy work is work that can be applied as ingredients to help optimize the sport specific plyometric work or whatever sprinting work you're doing or, or pitching in the example to keep that to, to just optimize your, your athlete or your client's uh, ability to do efficient work. Right. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And no, look, we're not, um, I, I think a, a pretty key take home point for your listeners is there's a big gap between local tissue loading and the demands of the sport. Right. So just because you've restored local tissue capacity doesn't necessarily mean that your athlete is is ready to return to the sport. And I've I've heard horror stories. Karen told me a story about um, you know a, a doc a doctor who had a who had a an adolescent patient come with a high ankle sprain. He was in a in a boot for for four weeks and. The, the parent asked the, the the doctor, when can he go back to sport? The doctor said, well, as soon as the boot comes off, right? And there's a, there's a big gap between biological healing and being ready to compete, just as there's a big gap between restoring local tissue capacity and being ready to compete. Now, the best programs are the ones that, have, that are overlaying the sport-specific capacity. So you don't... When you're, when you're restoring local tissue capacity in those early phases of injury, that doesn't mean that you can't do any global tissue load or global capacity work or sport-specific work. It, it may be that you can't sprint, but it's, there's a whole heap of other things that you probably can do, right? So that you're just working your way back and saying, well, okay, if I can't sprint, can I, can I do fast running? No, I can't do fast running. Um, well, can I do high intensity cycling? Yes, I can do that. Can I jog? Yes, I can do that. Can I change direction? Yes, I can do that. So you're you're trying to find all the things that you can do to maintain sport specific capacity because what you don't want to create, you've already got an issue. You've got a local tissue problem, right? It's there's an injury that you're trying to restore local tissue capacity. You don't want to create a second problem where sport specific capacity falls to the basement. Mm. Right, because then you've got two problems. You've got to restore local tissue capacity, and you've got to restore sport-specific capacity. Um, so, so the best programs are, are, are inter, uh, interlaying those or overlaying those. They're trying to maintain um, global capacity, sport-specific capacity, as you're building local tissue capacity back. And how much in an ideal world is the physical therapist or athletic trainer intermingling with the strength and conditioning coach to ensure that we're optimally, you know, we're client or athlete focused in every stage of their rehabilitation to, you know, building workload capacity. You'll see my, my role with a lot of sports is is kind of a, it sits as a bridge between between the physical therapist and the and the strength staff so we we'd call it a reconditioning coach so it's it's somewhere between being injured and being returning to to peak performance or being returning to to play or returning to compete um so what what that you know in, in my role those those two groups the physical therapy and and the strength coaches they they're talking all the time because because of that bridge so um you know even if even if the strength coach isn't isn't always in the in the room with the physical therapist i know exactly i know exactly where that athlete's come from so i know exactly what they've done in physical therapy and i know exactly where they're going so i know exactly what the strength coach has planned for them right so then what that allows me to do is 
is a, a seamless progression from from rehab back to play, back to compete. Um, and those those programs, like if you don't have a reconditioning coach, you you want the the physical therapist and the strength coach communicating pretty regularly. Um, ideally, from from day one, you have a physical therapist, you have a, a strength coach, you have an assistant coach, and you have the athlete themselves involved in the return to play process. And every one of those players, those four people, they they have a role. They they're in, they're involved in the contract. Right, so their this is their obligation. This is their responsibility. This is what they're accountable for, and and there's a timeline in place. Um, every one of the people in that group are trying to trying to speed up the timeline as safely as possible, and we need the athlete on board that as well. That if it's a six week injury, we we want him working hard to get back in five. Um, so there's. And, and I think that having an assistant coach involved in it as well, it, it means that the reintroduction to sports-specific skills isn't an afterthought. It's not mm-hmm. something that occurs, oh, we're, he's about to play on Sunday. <laughs> okay, we've got a walkthrough. We better, we better get some reps in. Um, you know, the, the, last, the last day prior to, prior to game day, you, you want that to be a seamless reintegration as well. So you can do low-level skills throughout the process. You can do, um, you know, there's a whole heap of different skills that you can do, including perceptual training. That can be done in the injured state. Um, and, you know, that we've, we've just done some work looking at um, mental image and how that might be official, not only from a rehab standpoint, but also um, to support skill acquisition when you are injured. So there's there's a whole heap of things that that athlete can be doing um, with the different people, the different staff. Members. That's uh, that's really cool that the mirror imagery is is making its way into sport because we in the physical therapy community use mirror imaging or or imagining or mental imagery to look at. We understand that the brain when we think about doing something is going to fire similar uh, similar neurons than if we're actually moving. So if we're able to get people to bend forward, for example, I deal with a lot of lower back issues and a lot of people have sensitivities to bending forward. Some of the time I just think, listen, think about bending forward. You're not bending forward, but just think about it. So we're able to kind of groove those patterns and maybe dissociate the pain from the 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 movement but it's it's also pretty cool that you can use in that same vein the physical therapist can then implement some of the mental imagery to optimize their sport performance even if they can't for whatever reason i'd be interested and and i'm not familiar with the literature you probably are too more so even just having athletes think about sprinting or having them think about cutting is that does that translate to similar like um, neuronal firing patterns, or how did that mental imagery work in the study that you um, you were involved in? Yeah, well, ours was a, ours was kind of a, a practical review for for coaches and sports medicine professionals. So, um, you know, there's some evidence to to show that um, learning learning specific. Uh, weight training, Olympic lifting techniques can be can be improved with mental imagery. Um, things like uh, EMG activity, if you just through thinking about doing specific movements or specific contractions, it can it can bring about EMG activity that that doesn't occur through control alone, right? So if you're if you're trying to get get the quads firing again following an ACL injury. Um, then mental imagery might might be something that you can employ really early on in the in the rehab process prior to being able to do much physical activity. You can you can prime it, you mm-hmm. can prime it with some mental imagery. Um, there's probably you know a few different ways that you can do it when you when you have someone who's 
at high loads and you want to refresh them a little bit but not actually give them the complete session off, then you, you might be able to remove them from physical activity and, and still do some mental imagery. Or you, if you're, you've got an injured or a rehabbing athlete, then you can use it at different times as well. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a few a few different uh, applications for it. And I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's just like a, an, I don't think – it's not as effective as the physical practice. Um, so if you just did physical practice or if you just did mental imagery, then the physical practice would be better. But if you combine physical practice and mental imagery, then you then there is an additive um, effect there that you, you can get you can get better effects. Um, so so in that respect, it, it probably does have relevance as, a, as something that you can add to part of your toolkit toolkit um, as a physical therapist. Yeah, it's fascinating, especially if you you can activate different neural pathways than if you were simply exercising physically. I think that is very interesting and has potential, you know, serious implications for those that you're looking to give them a day off or part day off or optimize neural like optimize the neural pathway so they don't lose something their explosiveness i i think that that is definitely one of the most underutilized aids to performance i mean you don't really hear much about mental imagery being used you hear about the hot and sexy you know new monitoring tools or you know, stuff that they can wear. I mean, listen, I'm a BFR guy, but you still hear about BFR and performance and things like that. Um, but nothing like mental imagery is not that sexy. So it's not getting, <laughs> it's not getting the, the uh, attention that I think um, it could at least within its role in a injury uh, return from injury, optimal performance type setting. Is there anything else you have to, to say about, um, about that? No, you're you're probably right. It's it's because we're, uh, let's call it, you know, we're 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 scientists that are that are more interested in the hard science, as opposed to the the science that's harder to see. Um, you know, the, the mental stuff is is harder to see science. So, um, you know, we're we're probably going to gravitate more towards the the things that we know best you know, in terms of physical exercises or the application and prescription of, of training um, before we'd go to something like mental imagery. But I, I mean, I use it in my own training when I, um, when I'm getting ready for a race, for example, I'll, I'll um, you know, I, I picture how I want to be running, picture, you know, how I want to be feeling at certain stages. I picture if I come to my opponent, what I'm going to do at that particular stage, what I need to do. If if they react a certain way, what am I going to do? If they don't react a certain way, what am I going to do? Um, and and picture you know different critical moments of of a race. You know, and the more the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And what we know is typically experienced performers are have are better at mental imagery than than novices. Um, they're they're better able to hold the image, the, the an appropriate image in their head, uh, and that you know that comes with practice as well. So um, I mean, it's not for everyone. Not everyone, not everyone wants that from from their training, or, or you know, not everyone kind of buys into that that the psychology part, the the mental aspect of performance. But to me, you, know, you can't separate the brain from the body. It's um, it's just uh, for me. It's such a such an integral part of training. So if I can get a a one percent edge through doing it, I'll try it. I mean, a one percent edge in in high level athletics is huge. Um, that's I mean, that's between probably placing or not placing, right? Um, so moving on, I, I want. I want to talk about, because this is something I recently saw on your page, you know, you're tracking your total running volume over the last couple of years. 
talk to talk to us about your training, your training volumes, what you've been doing. How do you plot out your own training? And how is that mirror or not mirror some of the work that you're doing with with these athletes? Uh, well, in general, I, I on a week to week basis, I have a, a pretty it's pretty structured in what I do. Um, I, I know on any given day what my training will look like. I, I generally employ a, a polarized approach to training. So so what that means is I use a high low approach. Um, where I I want to I want to try and be really disciplined around my low days, right? So keep my low days low, and what that allows me to do is make my high days higher, right? And and this is this is something that you know I've had to learn myself is, um, you know, you hear people saying, oh, I don't have any easy days. Every day is a hard day. I want to train hard all the time, and and there will be certain certain coaches that have that mindset there will be um, you know certain sports that have that mindset more than others um, but what what actually happens when you when you train like that is um, you over you your intensity on your recovery days is higher than you want so you're you're training harder than you want on your recovery days so that what that means is if you're under recovering because you're training harder on those recovery days, it means when you actually go back and do a, a high day, the high day is not as high as you want it to be. It actually drags it down. So rather than having a really big range where you have high highs and low lows, you, you, that range becomes closer together and it, it, you end up doing a whole heap of junk training. You're under recovering, you're not recovering well enough and therefore you're not training hard enough. So that's, that's part of the reason behind the polarised approach, using a high-low approach. Um, and, and typically, uh, I, I just I base I base my, the timing of my high days around the the expected or, or the predicted response of the tissue and the system to a particular stress. So if I'm if I'm having my high days, generally I allow three days recovery between high days, and that's because in terms of um, eccentric muscle contraction in terms of high intensity anaerobic system activity in terms of high intensity CNS activity you, you can't do that every day you, you need time and typically we allow 72 hours recovery there so so if I'm if I'm doing a high day on Tuesday I'll I won't come back and do a, a similar high day until Friday Wednesday Thursday Friday that's 72 hours now, if I'm if I'm thinking about next week, then I've got to I've got to think about my lead out time. I've thought about my lead in time between sessions, my lead in time to the next session. Now I've got to think about my lead out time. How long do I need to leave in order to be recovered for my next session? So then I go Saturday, Sunday, Monday. The earliest I could go back is Monday, but typically what I do is I do it on Tuesday again. So my high days are Tuesday, Friday. I know they're going to be high days. And I, I consolidate my high days and I, I, I make everything on that day. It's going to be a high stress day. So I, it's generally a, a lower body session in the morning and it'll be fast running in the afternoon. And it's not high volumes of fast running. It's, you know, I'm, 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 there's nowhere, like if you looked at the volume I'm doing, there's not a huge amount of volume, but it's, it's high intensity. And then, then I'll, so my Monday will be an upper body lift and a low intensity run. Tuesday will be a lower body lift and a high intensity run. And then I generally repeat that on Thursday, Friday. And Wednesday is generally a low day because I'm feeling pretty sore. And then one day on the weekend is is generally an off day as well. And I'll, I'll have one more long, long run in there. So you can see that I'm following a low, high, off, low, high, off um, kind of approach. Um, and, and you're right, if, if you, I don't know if, if, I, if I posted that or I put it on a story, but, um, yeah, I've been able to track the distance. Sorry, it was a story. But it yeah, was right. boom, boom, boom. It looked, well, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it just looked like year by year you were getting uh, more and more volume um, to your running. Yeah, I mean, I mean like, there will be a point where that'll that'll taper out a little bit and it'll flatten out. But I mean, I, last year I think I got close to fifteen hundred miles um, of running. Um, so you know, I'd probably aim for something similar again this year and. Um, part of part of the fun part, I guess, is is getting it. When I do travel, I try and build in a bit of time where I will I will go to different, you know, whenever I go to a different location. If I go to New York City, then I will do a half marathon in the city somewhere. Um, and I've done like I, I think last year I probably did I don't know thirty or forty half marathons, but in twenty different. Uh, locations, international locations. So, in you know, different places in California and Texas and uh, Montana, all, all over the place. Uh, so, it's a good way to see a see a city, but it's a pretty easy way to accrue volume. I I don't doubt that. I am a I am a, a newbie ish to running, but uh, it's it's tough to kind of get that volume up there for me being 213, 215 pounds. Um, but I do kind of, I guess I actually was thinking of you when we talk about the acute to chronic workload, because I started in the pandemic running and I was, I was getting, I would like build up, build up and feel really good. And then half strain. And then it would knock me out for a little while. And then I feel good calf strain. And so it, it really came down to very, I, I mean, really it was, it was the most, it was so it was more precise than I thought I was ever going to have to get with my training to be able to say, Hey, I need to dose it a stimulus here, not go more than that. Cause you probably know, sometimes you're running, you're like, Oh, I'm good. Like I can go more. And sometimes you push, sometimes you, and I would assume more times than not, you probably stop with whatever volume that you're, you're, you're planning on getting. And ever since then, I mean, I've really been able to, and it's taken years, but been able to run three now up to four and a half miles um, at a clip, which for me, I was always getting injured. It was always a problem. And so really it was, it was, it was taking it back to the conceptual building up chronic workload and then being able to stress it enough. So we're still creating more adaptation over time. It's just my adaptation has been like a quarter of a mile and then a half a mile and then like riding that out for, for a while. Um, yeah. So I mean, but that makes there. sense too, right? Because you, you are, a, um, you know, for a long period of time, you've developed a chronic load in a different way. Mm -hmm. you, you've done a lot of uh, strength hypertrophy training, and not necessarily been a been a runner. Whereas you, you know our our paths have probably been different in that in that respect. Mm -hmm. I I've, I've been running a, like since I was a kid. Like, and when I say running, like cross countries and and lots mm -hmm. of volume. So, um, so so for me to um, accrue the chronic strength training load it takes it takes me time of, you know it's a different type of training for me it um uh, i love it but it's um you, you know i i don't have the, the training history there that i mm -hmm. i mean i've got a long training history of strength training but nowhere near the the amount that i have in running mm -hmm. um so so i may i'm able to you know, there's, there's times where I've been able to push a little harder. Um, the reality is, though, when, you, when you're doing 60-plus miles a week in some weeks, um, it's very hard to add more on top of that. The runners would look at that and they go, "Let's I do that every week. But um, pro they're probably not doing the amount of strength training either. Um, yeah, I think doing. It, it's, it's interesting because now that I've, run a little bit more um i've had to be more selective on when i'm going to exercise my legs because i've definitely found that and i couldn't really appreciate this until i started running a little bit more that 
it does have an impact, right? I mean, it really comes down to what the dose makes the poison. And if you're going to strength train and build up local tissue capacity, but that local tissue capacity that you're building up, you know, you're sore the next day, and then that impedes your sports specific work. Well, then that is a reason that people get turned off of strength training. So it really comes down to if, if people are serious about merging and being the best runner or being a more hybrid athlete is what I like to think about it, then you really need to sit down and look at what are you doing on a weekly basis? And then what are you doing? What have you done in the months or years prior to prepare you for that weekly volume and how that compares? Because if not, you're setting yourself up to get hurt. Right. Yeah, you're right. And, and, you know, when I was talking about my, my high stress days and I consolidate that I use, I, I train legs in the morning and I run in the afternoon. Um, I know that, I know that my legs are going to be, they're going to have to, they're going to have to work pretty hard on that day. But prior to me consolidating, I, I had a program where I was, I had it flipped. I'd do my leg session on Monday. I'd run high intensity on the Tuesday. And what I was finding is, is I was just, I was always sore and, and my legs were not getting anywhere near enough recovery. Um, it takes a little bit of time to adapt to, to having the, the legs on, you know, all on one day and, and having your high stress consolidating that on, on one day. But when you, once you adapt, um, you, you you see the improvements come and, and it comes really quickly and um, you know at my age you, you, I, I probably shouldn't be getting faster but in the last in the last three years just through being just consistency it's there's nothing you wouldn't look at at anything I do from a training perspective or from a periodization perspective as being complicated and um, you but you you look at it, and the strength of it is is the simplicity and the consistency. It's it's just being able to, um, if I'm planning to do ten sessions in a week, um, how often have I been able to get those ten sessions out? Mm -hmm. um, and and when you when you're able to do that, and you can say, you know, that you've had ninety percent, you had you achieved ninety percent of what you plan to do. And you do that pretty regularly, you'd be surprised at how um, how much you improve and how quickly improvements come. I think people just they the the whole notion of you know they want their adaptations yesterday, even though these things happen in the course of months or even years um, of true adaptation. And you know, you mentioned legs on the same day as running. But if you did legs the day before, you'd be wrecked the next day. And I, I have a little theory about that. Um, you know, a lot of times the the muscle damage process itself is a process that happens over the course. It doesn't happen immediately. It happens. The, the delayed onset muscle soreness takes time. So if you're if you're still training in the same day, you might have the fatiguing um, effect of that muscle damage, but you're not having the soreness that's associated with that exercise, which I think that perceptual barrier is, is the barrier that, that really impedes performance because unless you're doing sprint work, a lot of the times you're not maximizing your motor unit recruitment anyways. So the muscle fibers that you've already fatigued out, at least in the running that I do are, you're not going to be recruiting those anyway. So it's not going to impact it. So the only thing that really would impact it would be whether or not your legs feel like bricks because they're, because they're so sore. Um, I don't know, you know, I know you run a lot more than me, so maybe that, that, that might be different, but that I've noticed that too. Like the next day after I do legs, even when I cut out my legs, like I do my upper body, I train my upper body twice a week, maybe three times a week, depending, but I do lower volume legs, especially with running. I've had to cut down to one, maybe one and a half times a week because I just noticed that I can't run 
or, or do the other cardio as efficiently, but particularly running um, because of that, like that next day, like, oh, it just feels like much harder. It's like, it's, it's, it's a mental, it's definitely a mental block. So I can empathize with the runners who are like, yeah, you tell me as a physical therapist that you need to improve, you know, using our language, local tissue capacity to be able to help me uh, be more resilient to injury. But then I perform like shit the next day, or I feel like crap. Like, why would I want to continue to do that? And it's, it's a, it's a tough conversation to, to have, um, with, with the everyday person. I can only imagine an athlete that, you know, is, is very much making their livelihood on their performance. And they're seeing that this, there's this demand that this perceptual demand that's kind of getting altered from this hybrid training and how they might be, you know, um, uh, recalcitrant in nature to kind of, uh, to make adjustments until you present them with the evidence, whatever that evidence would, would be. Yeah. I mean, that, and you know, what, what you described there is, um, pretty much what every person goes through when they start a training program. You know, whenever, whenever we, we start a training program, the, the first response is that, that shock phase where you actually might go backwards. <laughs> you feel like you're going backwards. Um, but with adequate recovery in between, in between those uh, loading doses, then you start to go through an adaptation phase, and and that's that's when you start to get better, right? So it's just it's just applying you know, general adaptation syndrome, really, and and understanding that you might you might feel a little bit, you might not feel the greatest when you first start it, and everyone is going to feel the same way. Everyone feels like that, um, and it, like I train, I train pretty regularly. But um, you know, I did a session with my my son this morning, and we did a few different exercises that I don't normally do. And I, I can almost guarantee you, I'm going to be sore tomorrow. Um, I, I always I'll do legs twice a week, but we just did a couple of a couple of different exercises. Um, yeah, so it's it's just that's the nature of it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you can if you can push towards it's like any stress if you can push towards it you you get better at tolerating the stress you, um, and that's that's what I would say to runners if um, yes you, you might feel that way f- for a short period of time um, it's a but it's a little bit of short term pain for a massive long term gain mm-hmm. right so so just take your medicine for this little bit of time take your medicine. Um, just grit your teeth, get through it because things will get easier for you. That's, that's kind of the, 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 the way I'd approach it with my athletes. So we've covered, uh, we covered your journey, your interest in, in monitoring training loads, the implications. Um, you, I know we have, you know, about five to 10 minutes left and then, um, I want to wrap it up. I want you to just talk about you tr- you you talk about the courses that you teach. So you travel internationally and you give um, you give your courses training smarter or training smarter and harder um, and the training performance puzzle. Just plug like a minute or two for any interested practitioners that might be listening or watching what these courses are about, what they would learn and where they can find out more information for, for, for them as uh, students. Yeah, look, I, I've, I've started thinking a lot about this. It's about load mastery. You know, it's about uh, if, if, you're working, if you're working as a strength coach, then it's about understanding programming, periodization. Um, if you're working as a physical therapist, it's about uh, loading appropriately in rehab, Take, getting your athlete or client or patient off the table and and getting them back to some sort of functional outcome. So understanding that there might be a role for passive therapies, but as soon as as soon as possible, we want to introduce active therapies. Um, so and and with with the amount of research that's out there, with the amount of information slash misinformation that's out there. Um, and that you can find on on any of the social medias. Uh, it's about putting some 
some sense back into your world so that you can actually walk away from the course on Sunday and first thing on, on Monday morning, you've got some new tools that you can apply with your patients, with your clients, with your athletes. Uh, the both both courses are um, they're gonna they're gonna challenge challenge your thinking. I get challenged every time I I do one. Um, every time you know a new paper comes out, it's it's been born from one of those courses. You know, right? So um, and and a question that's come from the courses every every time I come to New York, I, I have a great time. Um, we always have a great group, but it's about um, challenging your thinking, challenging your biases, being able to work work through problems and, and solve some problems um, and develop a rationale around your training programs and your rehab programs. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of a, that's a quick summary of, of both both the courses. There's different, different emphasis. Um, we go into a little bit of wearable technology in the second course but and programming, but... Um, you know, the, the idea is to take the research and, and show you how it's applied in practice. And I've I've taken both of, of his courses and Tim is uh, the astute professional. Um, you know, I've I've definitely admired his um, his ability to give a, a great course. So if you're interested in learning from Tim, and helping help your athletes and and maybe even help yourself um definitely recommend checking out uh his course where can they find information about said course and then plug unless there's anything else that you want to mention before as my voice is uh crazy uh, up, anything yeah. else you want to you want to mention before we wrap this up this is your platform yeah well look um gabbettperformance.com is is where you'll find all the information about the courses and uh, so and there's a, an email address there if you ever want to get in touch but it's g a b b e t t performance.com um, you can you can also find me on you know any of the any of the social medias um, so if you just do a search for for gabbett tim or tim gabbett you'll find me um, you know, you know, post post different papers on 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 the different social media. So if you're, if you're looking for some free papers to have a read, um, to get a feel for the kind of stuff that's that I do, the research I do, or um, you know, just just request any of the papers, and I'll um, I'll send them out to you as well. Cool. Well, it was a pleasure. Um, definitely, when you're when you're in New York again. Would love to uh, grab a brewski and uh, get nerdy and talk. I know we didn't get a chance to talk about your updated thoughts on blood flow restriction. Maybe that's for a, a return to to the podcast at some point. But I just wanted to say thank you for your time. And, um, and yeah, if you're interested in taking one of his courses, definitely check it out. So thank yeah, you. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Uh, look, and when you're as cool as us two, we couldn't get nerdy if we tried. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll catch up when I'm in um, when I'm in New York next. That'll be that'll be sometime this year. I'll be heading there. So, cool. Uh, yeah, it'll be good to catch up. Hopefully, hopefully, I'm around. Um, all right. Well, okay. everyone, that's the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time. And that was today's episode of the BFR Better for Results podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, I would love if you subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. I really appreciate the support.